You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Harvey? And hear you, loud and clear. How's the monitor picture? Still distorted. Then we've got a few minutes left. Check your controls. Make sure the red switches are all on. Check. Now the blue ones. Check again. Any overloads? Well, your amperage is steady, voltage and input. You sure you want to go through with this? You sound positively funereal, Harvey. I sound the way I feel. I'm helping you because you asked me, Paul. I can give you my support as an engineer. But enthusiasm is something I just can't dredge up. No sense of adventure. A sense of wonder, perhaps. And a sense of concern for a friend who's placing himself in jeopardy unnecessarily. You could just as well test the process with a lab rat or a monkey, but with yourself. Why? A monkey can't take field notes. But if you're so sure it works. I know it works. The challenge now is to use it. To better the world, if possible. Otherwise, it's just a machine that moves atoms from one temporal location to another. Sort of like a shuttle bus between centuries. Take it to the physics department, then publish your work officially. Do you know how much funding you'll have? You'll also have a Nobel Prize, if that means anything to you. It doesn't. In fact, it's what I don't want. If it's possible to change the past for the better, then it's equally possible to do the reverse. I can't take that chance. The world can't. Put this invention in the wrong hands, we're all through. If it is possible, I'll eliminate some of the suffering. If not, I'll know I tried. But... Either way, I'll destroy this machine as soon as I get back. You're in focus now, Paul. Good. That gives us three minutes to countdown. You've entered three sets of coordinates. Check. Paul. And I've got what I need. One tube of Dramamine, one Japanese pocket dictionary, one hunting rifle, disassembled with a telescopic sight, one long-range hollow point round. I'll only have the chance for a single shot. Anyway. Wait a minute. Harvey, where is it? Paul. Where's the cartridge? I have it. Well, give it to me. All right. The cartridge, Harvey. Now, I have a little over two minutes. Paul, this is crazy. It's too dangerous. Dangerous? Did you drink milk this morning, Harvey? What's that got to do with... What was the strontium-90 content in the glass? Did it occur to you that the things you've been eating and drinking might turn your bones to sawdust? Or guarantee that a child of yours might come into this world without arms or legs? The air you breathe today, what was in it? Harvey, old friend, you can talk to me about danger, but I don't have an exclusive franchise on risk. You know what I think? I think you just don't like the 21st century. I do not, Harvey. We're living in a septic tank. A gigantic cesspool in which runs the dregs, the misery-laden filth of man. Hatred, prejudice, violence. And man is the keeper of all this. He's also the scientifically advanced monkey who walks upright into an abyss of his own making. His bombs, his radioactivity, his fallout, his poisons, everything he designs is about dying. Harvey, we live in an exquisite bedlam, made even more grotesque by the fact that we don't recognize our own insanity. Did it ever occur to you that these scientifically advanced monkeys make bombs in order to survive? That across this planet there are other monkeys who would pulverize us into dust if they thought they could get away with it? I don't need a lesson in current events. The freedom-loving monkeys make bombs, the aggressors make bombs, and ultimately somebody pushes a button and just as ultimately the Earth disappears. There will of course be a few germs who rise up out of the rubble and wave microscopic flags of victory and shed microscopic tears for the human race. Are you content with that, Harvey? But what you propose to do about it, to change history, is incredible. There is a logic and a paradox about time travel, you know. Haven't you read any science fiction? Granted, there's no guarantee, but if I fail, you simply cross off one insignificant human. One frail, protesting member of the race. Look at it this way. If I fail, if I wind up in hell, or limbo, or a cemetery, the responsibility is exclusively mine. Now do me one last favor, Harvey. 
Get back to the console and start the countdown. I should know better than to argue with you, Paul. I hope you make it. You know that. See you soon. Time will tell, Harvey. Time will tell. Ready? Ready. T minus ten, nine, eight. Here we go, my friend. The great adventure begins. Your image is wavering. My God, Paul, I can see the bones through your skin. Get the first coordinates. Two, one, zero. Godspeed, Paul. Godspeed. Exit one Paul Driscoll, a theoretical physicist and a creature of the 21st century. Unknown to his fellow researchers, he has worked up a complicated theorem involving the space-time continuum, built a prototype, a kind of time machine, if you will, and dared to put it to the test with himself as the subject. But he's attempting to use it for a purpose that doesn't include cheap thrills or personal gain. In a moment, he will seek out three history-changing events from the past in a desperate attempt to alter our less-than-perfect present. One of the oddest and most rarefied perks available to faculty members in The Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, No Time Like the Past, starring Jason Alexander with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There, I've finished my captain's log for tonight. So, you said that this is a matter of some urgency, Mr... Uh... The name is Driscoll, but that's not important. Perhaps you will be good enough to tell me, sir, what this is about. I'm due on the bridge in a few minutes. Captain, is there any possible way you can alter your course? I beg your pardon? The course the ship is taking, can it be changed? Since my country is a belligerent, and these waters are a zone of combat, I would prefer to consult with higher authority before taking such a step. Suppose I were to tell you, sir, that if you hold your present course for five more minutes, this ship will go down. Just who are you, Mr. Driscoll? You won't find me on your passenger list, Captain. Oh? And you got on board how? That's not important. But I'm not sailing for my health this trip, Captain. You might say, I'm sailing for your health, and that of the crew and all the passengers aboard. I happen to know that this ship is going to be torpedoed, right off the old head of Kinsali Island, May the 7th. That's today. How do you know this? If I were to tell you, you'd say I was a lunatic. I can't alter the course of the Lusitania simply on the word of one man. All right, Captain, say I am a lunatic. Say that everything I'm telling you is just the product of a deranged mind. What would you lose by altering course now? How many minutes? That's not the point. That is the point! Captain, there'll be over 1,100 people drowned. That will be enough, Mr. Driscoll. And if you should be one of the fortunate few, Captain, remember when that court of inquiry convenes. I must ask you to leave, sir. I'm not asking you to scuttle the ship. All I'm suggesting is if you change course one degree, just one single degree. Steward, come in here. Yes, Captain. Escort Mr. Driscoll from my quarters. Yes, sir. Come along if you would, sir. Captain, there's still time. And still time to confine you to your cabin. Take him away. Sailor, take a look at the water off the bow. What do you see? Sir? Something under the water coming this way. Do you see it? Captain, sound the alarm. You, how did you know... Yes? I am here to prepare your room, mein Herr. Uh, that won't be necessary. But I have clean towels, sir, and soap. Just a moment. Ah, you have the loveliest room in the hotel, mein Herr. Yes, yes, yes. It's a lovely view. More than a view, sir. 
In a minute from that window, you will see history unfolding. Why do you know that this whole side of the building has been rented? Every floor. All because of the Führer, so they can see him. Down in the street is a madhouse. That's what I was told. You are not German. I'm an American. An American. And what do they think of our Führer and the new Germany in America? We're quite neutral. You say neutral, but you mean something else. No, I, I don't mean anything. You hear? That is the new Germany. Something you will never understand. That, madam, is the old Germany. Something you'll never understand. We will see. All right, just one shot. Not Goering. Only Hitler. Right through the forehead. Come on, buddy. Step into the crosshairs. No! It's jammed! That's Risco! Open up, bitte! Mach schnell, Herr Dress. You will open up the door. But I tell you, he was in here. Maybe you were drinking schnapps. There's no way he could have gotten out, except head first through that window. Look, what is that? A rifle. America, come. It's about time. Sit. You're the chief of police? I was told you speak English. I venture to say that I speak it better than you speak Japanese. Uh, I hardly speak any Japanese, but what I'm about to tell you is the most important English you've ever heard. Mr. Driscoll, is it? You happen to be an enemy alien. Which is the reason? Which is the reason I've been kept in a cell for six hours. And the reason you may have cause to regret this particular arrest. Go on. What I tried to tell your guards is that inside of an hour, this city is going to be destroyed. And upwards of a hundred thousand human beings will be destroyed along with it. Indeed. You're about to be bombed out of existence. But there's something you can do. Y you can begin some kind of an evacuation of women and children. You can save a few thousand lives. By who say so, Mr. Driscoll? Who do you represent? I don't represent anyone. Only the voice of history. That's extremely poetic, Mr. Driscoll. But most unfortunately, while I am sufficiently educated to appreciate lyricism, my official capacity makes me less prone to enjoy the subtleties and nuances of language for their own sake. All right, look. I'll give this to you very unsubtly with no nuances at all. There is going to be a bomb dropped here, and you're going to know a nightmare beyond any imagining. Excuse me. Moshi moshi. Hey. Ah, wakarimashita. A single aircraft, Mr. Driscoll. One lone B-29. I rather think we can survive that. That picture on your desk. Your wife? And my two daughters, age eight and ten. If you don't care about the city, do it for them. Look, this isn't just a request. It's in the nature of a... a prayer. Mr. Driscoll, I will make an assumption that you have some illness. I won't stand you against the wall and shoot you, even in wartime. I'll send you to the army headquarters, where you can be interrogated. You're an alien, and by rights should be interned. However, if you'll keep this in mind when you get back to your country, the face of the enemy is not devoid of compassion. And you might recall this conversation. If you survive, remember that the same thing could be said of your enemy. He tried to save Hiroshima. God, hey, take this man away. Where? Where did he go? And what? What is the great flash of light outside? Then what? Then nothing. The SS Lusitania, 1915, one of the causes of the First World War. Attempt number one. Failure number one. 
Then August 1939, the Hotel Berlin. <laughs> Another blow for law and order. Hitting nothing and accomplishing all the same. Finally, Hiroshima, August 1945. Three tries, three misses. Then you have to admit it now, Paul. The past is inviolate. What's happened must remain as it was. You can't change anything. Yes, I believe you. And so it follows that there isn't anything we can do about the present. <laughs> See that small brown book on the shelf? Bring it over to me, Harv, would you? The study of 19th century Midwest America. This one of yours? Mm, particular favorite. Open it up to, uh, to page 14. Talks about a certain place. I'll have a place called Homeville, Indiana. There are pictures showing what it looked like in 1881. Charming. Parasols, bicycles. All very serene. Apropos of what? Apropos of the fact that I'm going back there. One last trip in the machine. I thought you were going to destroy it, whether you succeeded or not. <laughs> going back there not to change anything, but simply to become a part of that world. A world of band concerts and... Summer nights on front porches. A world that hasn't heard of atomic bombs or germ warfare or anything else. That's where I'm going, Harvey. I've already packed my bag. The only book I'm taking with me is this one. Of course you are. And there's no one who could hold you back. But remember this. Everything is cause and effect. You go back in time to this, this Homeville, and you inadvertently change one event, alter it minutely. You might start a chain reaction beyond anything even you could imagine. I'm going back there to live, not to change what doesn't need to be changed. Now, Harvey. Here are the coordinates. How about it? All right. God help me, Paul. And God help you. Then, let's do it. All set. The mechanism's still charged. Enter the coordinates. Here we go, then. Five, four, three, two, one. How is it with you, Paul Driscoll? Wherever you are. No television sets. No nuclear arms. But just the same. How is it with you? What's yours, sir? I think, uh, a beer, please. That'll be a nickel. A nickel? That's the price tag. You got five cents? <laughs> I think I might. That's a five dollar gold piece. You, uh, you from around here? No, no, uh, from out of state. Just passing through? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I was thinking of settling down here. It's exactly as I thought it would be. You know anything about the, uh, boarding house across the square? Ma Chamberlain's. Real nice accommodations. Runs a clean place. Well, then I guess I'd better drink up and, uh, check it out. Come in. I brought you some clean linens. Room comfortable enough for you? Oh, very. Thank you. Should be. No mid-afternoon sun, southern exposure, and the best view I got. You a traveling man, Mr. Driscoll? No, Mrs. Chamberlain, I'm not. I don't hold with traveling men. What is your business? I'm a physicist. Hmm. Someday when I got more time, you can explain that one to me. Now, I might as well tell you the rules of the house. No visitors after 8.30. Lady visitors in the drawing room downstairs. No gambling, no chewing. Breakfast at 7.30 sharp. Dinner at noon, supper at 6. If you're late, you're out of luck. Each week's bill paid in advance. I think I understand. Well, I'll be going now. Got plenty to do. Will you be joining us for supper, Mr. Driscoll? I'd love to. That'll be a chance to meet the other boarders. 
Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Hanford, he's from the bank, and Miss Sloan. She teaches school here in town. Lovely girl. And a moral one, too. Very moral. I see. Well, you'd better. I run a decent place. Did I mention no hard liquor in the rooms? I'll remember that, Mrs. Chamberlain. See that you do. Afternoon, then. Nuclear fallout. Strategic wars in the Middle East. What happened to all that? It's summer. It's the first of July. There's going to be an evening band concert in a couple of days with lemonade and fireworks. It's 1881 in Homeville, Indiana. And by God, I'm home. But I tell you, Mrs. Chamberlain... More apple pie, Mr. Hanford. Until this government assumes its rightful place in the world, we will remain an isolated provincial community of states. You know what we should do? Oh, no, Mrs. Chamberlain. I could need another bite. We should take the American fleet, send it over to the Orient and plant the American flag, and then down to Australia and back across the Pacific to South America, planting the flag as we go, planting her deep and planting her high, flying her proud. You ought to run for office, Mr. Hanford. Believe me, Mr. Hoffman, I've thought of it. My friends have urged me to make my opinions known on some official plane, but finance comes first. It's the lifeblood of the nation. The bank needs me. You there, Mr. Driscoll, what are your views? I, uh, I don't have any, Mr. Hanford. Of course you do, man. Everyone has views on the destiny of our country. Now you take the case of the Indian Wars. All this nonsense about giving them land, as if savages could understand treaties. <laughs> Why, we should have had 20 George Custers and 100,000 men and just swept across the plains, destroying every red skin in sight. I think the country is tired of fighting, Mr. Hanford. We were bled dry by the late war. I think anything we can accomplish by treaty, as long as it saves lives, is very much the proper course to pursue. My dear young lady, I trust that this isn't the pap you spoon-feed your students. Treaties indeed. Peace. The virility of a nation is in direct proportion to its fighting abilities. I will live to see the day when this country fields an army of a million men who can sweep away anything in its path. <coughs> Oh, your pardon, Mrs. Chamberlain. I get carried away. Now, you're not some kind of pacifist, too, are you, Driscoll? Me? No, no. I I guess I'm just a poor fool who's seen too many young men die because of too many old men who fight their battles at dining room tables. Oh, my goodness. I take offense at that remark. And I take offense at armchair warriors who don't know what a shrapnel wound feels like. Or how death smells after three days in the sun. Or the look in a man's eyes when he knows he's minus one leg and the blood is seeping out of him. You have an enthusiasm for planting the flag, Mr. Hanford. But you don't even have a nodding acquaintance with what it's like to bury men in that same soil. I'll not sit here and listen to talk like that. Of course you won't. You'll go back to your bank and it'll be business as usual until the next dinner time when you'll give us another vacuous speech about a nation growing strong by filling up its graveyards. <laughs> Well, you're in for some gratifying times, Mr. Hanford. There'll be a lot of graveyards to fill. In Cuba, then in France, then all over Europe and the Pacific. You can sit on the sidelines and wave pennants because by your definition, this country is going to get virile as the devil. From San Juan to Inchon, we'll show how red our blood is because we'll spill it. And there are two very unfortunate aspects to all this. One is that you'll never have to spill any. And the other is that you won't live long enough to know how right I am. Oh, dear, such a violent man. Excuse me, please. Mr. Driscoll. Well, have I properly endeared myself to everyone inside? I've been here almost two years, Mr. Driscoll. Two years of mealtimes with Mrs. Chamberlain's homemade pies and Mr. Hanford's rhetoric. I lost a father and two brothers in the war, all three on a single afternoon. I was just an infant at the time, but for the twelve years my mother lived, we had a funeral every day. She never stopped mourning. I think they died for something, Mr. Driscoll. But tonight, for the
for the first time, somebody made a point that patriotism doesn't have to mean dying. Thank you for saying that, Miss Sloan. Call me Abby, Mr. Driscoll. Paul. Do you know something, Paul? You look like a man in love. Not with a woman. With... with a moment. A place. What did you mean when you said other graveyards, other wars? Those names, what are those places? It doesn't matter. Why do I get the feeling that... that you're standing outside looking in? That you're just passing by? I don't want to pass by, Abby. I want to come in. I wish... I wish I could. Why can't you? Everything is possible. Everything. Is it? I wish I could be sure. I... I believe I already am. Garfield's been shot! Quickly, what's the date? Why, the 2nd of July. Did he say the president's been shot? July 2nd, 1881, that's right. President James Abraham Garfield shot in a Washington railway station. But it just came over the telegraph. How do you know? How could you? You're wrong, Abby. Not everything is possible. Why, Paul? I can't tell you why. But it begins again. What do you mean? Nothing. So be it, then. So be it. It's late, Abby. Very, very late. It's time to go home. Oh. Good morning, Paul. Mr. Driscoll. We, uh, missed you at breakfast. Uh, sorry, I, I must have overslept. Is that the morning paper? Yes. You may read it if you like. I'm finished. The president was badly wounded. So I see. But there's hope for his recovery. I guess sometimes that's all that's left, isn't it? Hope. I suppose so. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe we should be more realistic. If we find something that we want and need but can't have, perhaps we shouldn't give in to hope. Abby, I... I'm sorry. I, I wish I could explain it to you, but I can't. It, I, I couldn't make you understand. It's perfectly all right. Really, it is. You've got to forgive school teachers. They're inclined to... to read too many things into a glance, a word, a touch. Well, I've got a busy day today. So much to do, preparing for tomorrow. Parade at nine, square dancing at eleven, games from noon to five, picnic supper, and then fireworks. And my children, of course. Your children? Twenty-seven flat little voices. Fourteen boys, thirteen girls, who will entertain you with their rendition of Columbia, the gem of the ocean, sung in twenty-seven different keys. I wouldn't miss it for the world. May I ask you a question? Please. Who are you, Paul Driscoll? And where are you really from? And that book you carry, what is it? It's just an old book of mine. It's nothing. Is it? All right, then. We'll leave it at that. How do, Mr. Driscoll? Morning, Mr. Hoffman. She does an awful good job with those kids, Miss Sloan. So I've heard. Pretty, too, for a school mom. The ones I had when I was a kid, they looked like they came out of a pickle jar. <laughs> Mine, too. You like this town? More than I can say. Well, you might make it here if you've got what it takes. And from what I've heard, I'd say you do. You want to be more careful with your words, though. Mostly Republicans. Still and all, a nice little town. Doesn't change. That schoolhouse, I'll bet she's 75 years old as she stands. And I expect she'll stand till somebody pulls her down. Well, morning to you, Mr. Driscoll. I'm off to work. God bless President Garfield. The school building. 
That's what I was trying to remember. Oh, my dear God. The site of the Homeville National Bank, formerly occupied by a school built in 1823 and gutted by fire on July 3rd, 1881, injuring 12 children. The fire was caused by a kerosene lantern on a runaway wagon. And I can't do anything. I can't warn anyone. It has to happen the way it's supposed to, like the president. I'm sorry, Mr. Garfield. Recover, you shall not. You're to die on September 19th of this year. In the schoolhouse, you are to burn this afternoon. A dozen children injured, and God help me, I have to stand by and let it happen. and gutted by fire on July 3rd, 1881, injuring 12 children. The fire was caused by a kerosene lantern on a runaway wagon. No! Everything is cause and effect. Go back in time to this home bill. Change one event. Alter it minutely. You might start a chain reaction beyond anything even you can imagine. How are you today, Mr. Driscoll? Whiskey, please. Bother you, does it? What? Those kids trying to sing. Well, they won't be at it long. What's that? Hard to keep them in during the summer, but Abby's doing a good job of it. Give me another one, will you? Sure thing. Something wrong? I ain't trying to butt in on your personal affairs, but you drink like a troubled man. If a man needs it, he needs it. So drink your fill. And may you drown them out, whatever they are. What time is it? Ten minutes or two? I give him another ten minutes or so. I've got to try. How's that? Why the devil doesn't she let them out of there? How's that? Nothing. Just a runaway wagon with a kerosene lantern. That's all it takes. All right, neighbors. Gather round and get ready for a revelation. Just close right in, next to the wagon. That's it. Know why I'm holding up this lantern? You're going to tell us anyway, ain't you? Like Diogenes, good friends, I'm looking for an honest man. Well, you ain't going to find one here. An honest man who'll try one sip of Dr. Malone's alternative and tell me it's not the finest medicine he's ever tasted. This little bottle right here, why, it combines all the treatments for scrofula. King's evil, ulcers, indolent tumors, rheumatism, gout, scurvy, neuralgia, enlargement of the bones, joints, and glands. Not to mention the liver and spleen. Also tetter, ringworm, biles, and carbuncles. And the cost, friends? A mere 25 cents the bottle. Do me a favor, will you? What's that, young man? Don't light the lantern. Why, I have to light it. To shed light on the subject. Please, put it out. An incredible price, you say? I'm not in the business for profit. I travel the length and breadth of this glorious nation to cure the sufferings of mankind. The ridiculously low price barely covers the cost of ingredients, bottling, and my own primitively simple existence. How about you, madam? Nervous disease? Dropsical swellings or constitutional disorders guaranteed to alter or depraved or impure state of the blood and other bodily fluids. Well, I suppose I'll try it. Better give me one, too. How much if I buy two? Why not a dozen? Take them home to your family and your neighbors. One twenty-five cent piece each. That's all. How about you, young fella? One swallow. And you'll feel more manliness coursing through your body. Unhitch the horses. What's the trouble? Dyspepsia? Liver complaint? Here's what you need. I need those horses unhitched from the other end of your wagon. Now you listen here, young man. They've stopped singing. That means they're almost finished. Look, I can't argue with you anymore. You've got to unhitch those horses. This wagon mustn't move from this spot. You get out of here now. Go on. You hear me? All right, then. I'll do it myself. Get away from my horses!
Abby! Abby, get the children out of the schoolhouse! There's going to be a fire, do you hear me? There's going to be a... Stop! Hold it! Stop! Oh, it's the whole schoolhouse! It's the fire wagon! Oh my god, the children! Get out, children! Run! Run! The children! Stay back! But I've got to get them out! Stop them! Hold them down! It's too late, mister! It's too late! <laughs> children. We got them out. Only a few were injured. None badly. Twelve children. How did you know? You did, didn't you? You knew it would happen. At two o'clock this afternoon, what I didn't know was that I would cause it. Who are you? It really doesn't matter. I shouldn't have come here. It can't work. I know too many things. Too many tomorrows, all the wars, all the catastrophes, all the tomorrows. How, Paul? How did you know? You're part of history, Abby. You and this town and the people in it, and I can't change you. I can't even touch you. Why not? Because the past is inviolate. It belongs to those who lived it. It's not for interlopers, but those who pass by and look in and wish they were a part of it. Goodbye, Abby. Stay well. Where are you going? Back to where I came from. Where I belong. I wanted bandstands and summer nights. Serenity. But the infinitely complicated mechanism of a human being. <laughs> he can't live with the threat of a bomb. And he can't live with burned out school buildings either. The finite or the infinite, it doesn't make any difference. He's always his brother's keeper. In a way, it was more than I expected because you were here, but I've overstayed my welcome. <laughs> Hello, Harvey. Back so soon? As it happens. Back a little late. You changed something? I tried to. And in doing that, I, I caused it. And now, where do you go, Paul? Here. Where I belong. That's what I've learned, to leave the yesterdays alone. I'd rather do something about tomorrow. That's what counts. The tomorrows. God. Let there be tomorrows. Incident on a July afternoon, 1881. A man named Driscoll who came and went, and in the process learned a simple lesson, perhaps best said by a poet named Lathbury, who wrote, Children of yesterday, heirs of tomorrow, what are you weaving, labor and sorrow? Look to your looms again, faster and faster fly the great shuttles, prepared by the master. Life's in the loom, room for it, room. Our tale of clocks and calendars in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD, or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663.
No Time Like the Past, starring Jason Alexander with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Michelle Graff, Nicholas Ruddle, Christian Stolte, Micah Jacoby, Owen Yen, Linda Ryder, Roderick Peoples, Rich Kamenick, Carl Amari, Vince Amari, Paul Patch, and Richard Shavzin. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>